Hello and welcome. I'm Taylor Payton of TheBeginnerDrawingCourse.com, and today I want to invite you to sketch with me. Basically, I just want you to take at least 11 minutes to grab a sketchbook or open a new document. You don't have to watch the video, but you definitely can. Just kind of glance up if you're looking at your sketchbook or, you know, take a little break from your canvas and check back. But I just want you to start drawing for about 11 minutes without stopping. And during that time, it'd be great if you really didn't think about what it is you're drawing. If you didn't try to impose some sort of structure or some sort of idea, but you just let your hand kind of move and warm up. If you just sort of sit back and become conscious of the sensations of moving your tool across the canvas or your picture plane, and kind of just watching that unfold, seeing the things that naturally happen with your mark making, with the way that your wrist, elbow, and shoulder kind of align, and really just getting into the process. You're not really trying to create anything specific. You're just making something happen initially. I find that for me personally, this is the best way to warm up. And even though on the screen you're seeing that I am sketching a character, you know, something very representational, something very common when it comes to the drawing game, it's still really good to work in abstractions and basics. So there's nothing wrong with that. I just think it's a really good way to get yourself into the mindset of drawing. And I find that when I jump straight into characters, I often have a little more friction than I would like which does not always lend itself to a good drawing session. But since this is just a sketch with me video, I wanted to have something on in the background so we can sort of draw it together. In future sketch with me episodes, maybe episode two, I'll rock some more abstractions and just sort of let those happen. But for now, we're just in character land. For you, however, I want you to just take a step back, continue observing, and just really let yourself have it. I don't want you to start judging. Don't let those judging thoughts or those thoughts of trying to make this into something or your next best piece or whatever weighty, cumbersome ideas jump into your mind at this time. Just don't pay those too much credence, really. They're not going to help you at this stage. And oftentimes, they don't really help you at all when asked all too frequently. The idea is just to really enjoy it. I want you to like it so much that you feel like you just shouldn't. You know, it's almost a guilty pleasure. I want you to put yourself in the process so deeply and to engross yourself in what you're doing as far as drawing goes that it should feel a little wrong that it's so good. You know what I mean? One of my mentors used the example of like, you're eating something that's just so delicious, you feel like God is judging you. And I thought that was hilarious and a really good way of trying to describe this feeling. It's about being so absolutely taken by the experience and really just neck deep, maybe even all the way over head over heels into what it is you're doing and that space in my experience is the best place to create from because when you're in that space it can often be described as the flow state now, i've been watching these videos by steven zapata and he is a fantastic uh, orator of these sorts of artistic ideas and truths and it's inspired this video, to be honest. Not to mention, I was watching Ahmed Alduri, who is another amazing artist who has been doing videos like this as well. And I thought, you know, those look like a lot of fun to make, and I haven't had this much fun drawing in years. But it's just really, really, you know, intriguing to be able to get back into it so assiduously. 
And I thought to myself, what is the difference? Why am I liking this way more than I have in years? And it turns out when you reserve judgment, when you just let your hand move, when you turn it into a Zen-like meditative experience, then there's all this freedom. There's all this room to create. When heretofore you had just been holding yourself to really rigid, really exacting notions that you picked up somewhere along the way in order to hopefully improve your art or hopefully improve your standing in the art community, the social hierarchy of what you perceive to be the industry and whatever it might be that had taken you down that path. I just want to do what those Steven Zapata videos, what the One Fantastic Week mentorship, and what the Ahmed al videos have done for me, and that is to free you. Because we have enslaved ourselves due to the expectations of others, the hopes of making an even better living at it or making a living at it at all, this art thing, and it just gets so very tiresome. You didn't pick up a pencil or a crayon or a paintbrush or an ink pen, whatever it may be, because you wanted to make a living at it right away. As a kid, you just wanted to express. You just wanted to see what colors came out, what shapes, what your hand could do when you could trace the places it had been. What kind of marks were going to occur as you expressed yourself through this medium. And that is, to me, one of the greatest things and the greatest feelings that as an adult you can have even more of. And that brings me to something I'm going to mention in this video and in future videos. And again, it's something very powerful that my mentors bestowed to me. And it is, what do you want to see more of? Once you've had your 11 minutes of drawing and you're kind of taking a step back and seeing what feelings you get looking at it, and you don't need to judge those feelings, you just need to look at them, you know, um, are they good, are they bad? They, those are not really as useful as you, you would like, you know. The more apt question, instead of trying to make something good or bad, is what does it feel like? Does it feel excited? Does it feel scared? Does it feel nervous? You can assign different labels and then kind of maneuver from there. But to try and make it bad or make it a reflection of self, of yourself, it's kind of a trap. And again, I want to free you from traps during our sketching sessions together. I want you to be able to navigate these things when I don't have videos for you. I want you to be able to navigate these things when you sit down with music or sit down quietly and just start drawing. And then you can move from some of the warm-up stuff to some of the more representational stuff. But I digress. Basically, once you're at a point where you've not stopped for 11 minutes or so, then you can stop. You can see what feelings are being elicited and just sort of run through that gamut. You know, as your eye travels to a particular spot on the artwork and you get a positive feeling, a feeling that feels right, ask yourself, what does this feel like? And do I want more of it? And that is the gift that my mentors handed me that I am now handing to you. When you look at something that feels good in art, whether you made it, whether someone else made it, ask yourself, how do I get more of this, more of this feeling? What sort of drawing techniques or what sort of subject matter, what sort of aspects that are identifiable on the picture plane do I need to put down in order to amplify this feeling? It's like you're filling up a vessel. You're filling up a picture with a delicious, amazing beverage. 
It could be your favorite tea. It could be milk. It could be whatever you want to drink where you're just, you take the first sip and your eyes almost roll to the back of your head. You know, it's just so delicious. So good. It is ambrosia. And once you can heighten and feel that feeling, you can use that as a benchmark. And I didn't know about this. I was just drawing rotely. I was just creating just to create. And I thought that's what you were supposed to do. But most of the feelings I was getting were very negative. I wasn't able to identify very good feelings. And if I so much as latched onto one accidentally, it wasn't something I could reproduce. I didn't have these sort of waypoints of what does this feel like and do I want more of it? I didn't have these questions to push myself and propel my art in the right direction for me to really enjoy the process. So that's what we're getting at here. We're trying to find these vessels that we can fill with the most delicious thing that we love, you know, the, the honey, the nectar that really makes us want to pursue this. And when you find those marks or you find those characters, you find those ideas, I want you to figure out what it is about that specific thing that you like and how can you make more of it? How can you amplify that feeling until it's almost to the point where it's too much? You know, if it's a way that you're making marks and those marks are just making your eyes dance and feel really good, then create more of those marks and try to make it so that it feels even better. It feels even more aligned, you know? It's like a glove that just fits. There's something so right about it. And these things are very nebulous. They are very hard to describe, but that's why I'm making these videos long, you know, so that we can sort of meander together and I can speak to your conscious and your subconscious as you float back and forth between my voice, between your drawing, between what you ate for breakfast, whatever thoughts are entering your head. Uh, we want to be able to hearken to some of these ideas over and over and lay down the proper um, waypoints, as I stated, the proper uh, neurology so that your nervous system can start to be more um, attuned to these things. You know, we are so adaptable as human beings. We can learn a myriad of skills and we can tap into just many, many sensations. And some of those sensations are immensely useful for art making. And they will not only heighten the joys of the process, but you'll be able to take the negative feelings and maneuver them in such a way that they don't deter you, but instead can be used merely as alarm bells to know that you are off track. You know, it doesn't reflect back poorly on you as the artist. These are the problems, but you are not the problem. And that's something that I learned from Stephen Pressfield. The problem is the problem, but you're not the problem. So once you can start to free yourself and unshackle from all of these things that you put yourself through, all of these things that had robbed you of joy time and time again, whether it's unfair or improper comparison to other artists, other people in your social sphere, it's just not about them anymore. It's about you and what you want to make and finding those immensely powerful feelings in your art that you can amplify. Because once you feel them, others will feel them too. And that is the secret to this sort of magical telekinetic connection that we can do and perceive as human beings. You're putting down these ideas and you're working with them and you're getting these sensations and you're amplifying them. And as you amplify these sensations, other people will feel them as well. And that is just something that is, I mean, it's astounding. It's beyond anything that you would have thought about as a kid. You know, we knew it on an intuitive level when we were young, but as you grow older, as you're able to uh, become cognizant of these things, it does seem very magical, even though we can reduce it to science for our understanding. So that's just something that I will, again, be revisiting in these Sketch With Me episodes. And wherever you're at in your journey, whether you're a beginner, whether you're intermediate, or whether you're advanced and you're stumbling upon this video, 
it's not so much about the techniques, although I will cover some of the techniques I'm doing just because I feel like they're helpful to remind you and to remind me of what's working and what's not working. Um, it, it's really more about freeing yourself up. It's about spending dedicated time, whether you only have 11 minutes or the full duration of this video, to draw and to create and to reconnect with those elements of your work, yourself, your emotions, your sensations that permit you to access new levels of that creativity, new levels of that joy. So one technique, just to shift gears quickly here that I want to talk about is to envision the character along these lines that converge at a point. So it's, it's a little bit like two point perspective in a very informal and abridged way that I'm using to create this character. And I feel that it was really successful at the end of the sketch. And I just want to remind you and myself that this is a technique I'd like to return to and refine for when I'm sketching characters in the future. You'll note that I have these lines that I'm drawing and they are guidelines essentially. It's a diagonal line that I place and then orbit the rest of the shapes around. And that diagonal guideline gives me so much uh, depth, so much information that I can just string the other anatomy and proportions and mark making around. Like when I just did one right there where we're getting to the feet. And I did it before to line up the knees. And they're really useful at joints, at the joints of the figure. They're really useful uh, in terms of the shoulder girdle and in terms of the pelvis. So once you have these diagonal lines that are nice and um, sometimes they're parallel, sometimes they're more convergent depending on the vanishing point and the perspective you're inferring, it's really nice to be able to use those lines to create amazing results of alignment with your characters, with your objects. Uh, the more hard surface you go, the more useful they will be. But I just wanted to draw attention to those diagonal lines that act as guides in the art making process so that the geometry and the shapes of your characters as you're laying them out can be more uh, believable, more dimensional. And I find that I don't use them often enough, even though I really liked the result. And I kind of play with them throughout the rest of this uh, sketching session. This was just a nice little Sunday session that I took breaks from and returned to throughout the day. Uh, just a good, you know, approximately 90 minutes of drawing. And it was really freeing and really fun. Sometimes I only have 25 minutes of this. Sometimes I get, you know, two hours. But it was really uh, enjoyable. Um, some parts I did get very frustrated at. And I could feel myself growing frustrated. And at those points, I would just stop and stop judging the frustration and ask myself, you know, why am I beginning to get frustrated? What is it on the picture plane that is setting off this alarm bell, the sensation inside me that is not delicious, that is not something I want more of. And when I stop drawing, as opposed to trying to solve the problem with my tool, I, I solve the problem inside first. I say, well, uh, this doesn't feel dynamic enough. It feels very stiff. And that stiff feeling gives me an upset feeling in my chest. And even as I recall the feeling, I can conjure it in my solar plexus, in my sternum, and feel it and know that whenever I feel this feeling, something is amiss. Something is either stiff or it is off or the alignment isn't quite right and I need to correct it. But it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with me. The problem is when you don't correct it, when you just keep drawing and pushing and not addressing the problem, then the feeling only grows until it becomes almost something that you can't stand. It becomes something that feels so unpleasant that it is the opposite of that ambrosia we talked about. Instead of going to a very high place of sensational wonder, 
you are falling to some sort of pit of woe. And it can feel a lot like depression. It can feel like anxiety. It can feel like any number of things that we would regard as less than pleasant. But it only amplifies if you don't stop and examine it and sit with it and then ask the right questions to dispel it. It's like you're uh, accidentally sort of casting a bad spell on yourself or the art is casting a spell on you and you need to know the process to undo it. You know, it's like how you would treat a burn or treat frostbite or treat and set a broken bone or a sprained ankle. There are processes, processes, I think that sounds better. There are processes that we can use to heal ourselves of certain unpleasant events and sensations. And during the art making process, you're probably not going to break your hand, but you will feel some really crappy feelings. And it's sort of an artistic self-healing to be able to understand what the art has created and conjured in you when you find that feeling and detach from it and how to actually fix it. Now, sometimes it's just as simple as stopping, which is usually the first step, and just evaluating, just realizing again, you're not the problem, the problem's the problem. How are you going to handle it? What is actually going awry in what you're doing? And how can you, to the best of your ability, fix it? And if you can't fix it, you could just make peace with understanding what went wrong and starting over with a new process, not following the same path that led you off the cliffside, but taking an alternate route, reloading your save file and attacking the boss a different way from the start so that you don't get murked. <laughs> you know, maybe you need to pull him away from his mob of minions so that they don't destroy you and mess up your spells or whatever it might be. There's all these variables, but there's always constants. And it takes a lot of dissecting of these issues to be able to solve them. And that's okay. It's all part of the process. And once you're willing to give yourself to the process and to detach from the pain feelings and taking those alarm bells as meaning that something is wrong with you, that you are in fact incompetent beyond measure and broken beyond repair, and you need to do something else that is going to soothe this feeling. You need to go and eat a big, dirty piece of cake or drink a stupid amount of liquor or soda to numb this feeling out. It's just a feeling. It's just a feeling. And those things will cover up that feeling for a time. But what you must do on your creative quest is to resolve the feeling. It is not to numb it out. It is not to find ways to circumvent it so you can continue because those are unhealthy coping mechanisms that actually don't harken back to what it is you should be doing. You need to have the courage to face whatever it is on the picture plane that is causing you stress, that is causing you to feel this duress that is arising. And you might feel it anywhere in your body. Your shoulder might get super stiff for no reason. Your breathing might get shallow and labored. But sometimes you just need to learn how to unwind physiologically, you know, to stretch, to breathe, to get new perspective and to let the feeling pass before you can come back with a clear head and address the issue. There are so many modalities for parsing stuff like this that all I can do is offer you options. Your journey is your journey, but I really wanted to share aspects of mine that may prove useful to you because my mentors did so for me. The wonderful people who I have not yet had a chance to meet, like the the uh, Steven Zapatas and the Ahmed Alduris and the Cynics Designs on YouTube that I've watched videos by and have had aha moments thrust upon me that have taken this creative journey and made it joyous for me again. I just want to share that because it's important. It's important for us to connect in this way. It's important for us to 
help those of us who have not been able to resolve these things, those of us who have become lost along the way, and to help be a light in that darkness so that we can draw ourselves closer and closer to our ideal. And whatever style you work in, whatever medium you work in, that stuff is all malleable. These feelings, these sensations, these processes, they're the things that are going to be foundational to creation. And I just think that you'll be able to make better work this way. Let's return to a different subject that we had broached earlier on, and that is the subject of what you want. Like, what do you want out of what you're making? This is not a great question to ask during your warm up because all you want then is to be free and to get warmed up and to maybe create something semi interesting. It's amazing for warm ups, and I'll cover that in a later video. Uh, something that's worked really well for me. Uh, again, sort of meditative in its pace, but I'll, I'll take you through the paces of what it is to warm up and to get your attention and your consciousness moving in different directions so that you can endow yourself with greater creative uh, verisimilitude. But at this juncture, I just want to talk about what you want out of each piece. You know, once you're already warmed up, once you're already kind of doodling and you, you got something going that you feel pretty decent about, you see some sparks happening and you want to turn it into a roaring wondrous fire that you can use to stoke your creative spirit. And that is kind of important. You know, it's kind of important to find out what you want from what you're making. For example, in this drawing, I'm working on my character, Kulti. And Kulti is one of the more interesting races of a fictional world that I returned to. And I wanted out of this drawing to showcase some of her personality in kind of a modified perspective. I wanted to use the diagonal lines like I had so effectively for the body type exploration in that sort of kind of pinkish magenta drawing of another character in that universe. Um, I was exploring her body type, exploring her pose. I wanted to do a similar thing with uh, Kulti here. And this drawing gave me a great deal of those frustrated feelings I was talking about earlier, because it is a perspective that I am not comfortable with. I use sort of a concept art, very straightforward eye-level perspective for the blue drawing, Balian. Um, all of these characters I draw in my character drawing course and talk more about some of the character drawing techniques in that course. Uh, but basically, I was just trying to find personality. I wanted some, some of that, and I wanted to draw in this specific kind of not fully frontal perspective, sort of this top-down view. And it's something that I haven't done a lot. I've drawn a lot of characters, and I mean many, many hundreds of characters in that straightforward eye level perspective. And I've drawn, you know, maybe one sixth of that many characters in the seated position or semi, you know, seated position you see Celia in. It's a, it's, you know, it's comfortable for me. It's not as comfortable as drawing them straight on in terms of like design but it is comfortable. This sort of altered perspective I'm drawing Kulti in, however, is very uncomfortable. And it's because I haven't done it as much. The grooves in my gray matter, in my brain, don't fire as fast for this type of drawing. And as a result, I'm making a lot of errors and having to correct them constantly, which starts to become irksome. It starts to create friction in the process. I'm always having to pump the brakes and go backward when what I want is to proceed. That's the basis. We can assume we want to proceed in our drawing process. We want to go forward in a way that feels less hindered, a way that feels very frictionless, very like it feels like you have a solvent, you know, it's not sticky and hard to uh, 
hard to perform. Imagine if you had honey all over your hands and you're trying to, you know, shred a solo on a guitar or play piano, but there's all of this viscous honey that's messing up your ability to articulate with your fingers. That's kind of what the feeling is when you can't proceed in drawing because you have to constantly correct every little thing you're laying down and you start to get really frustrated and that feeling in your chest builds and it feels kind of like anger. It feels kind of hot. It feels like your throat's closing up and your eyes are narrowing and your jaw is starting to clench and your hand is starting to tighten. And all of these things mean that you are going in a direction that is not productive. Your drawing is not getting much better, but you're sort of trying to control a, a kind of a train wreck, you know? It's trying to keep the ship from sinking when it is taking on water fast. It's not a fun place to be when drawing. However, I would say that it's an important place to be when drawing. It's something that, to me, reminds me of uh, something that I think I read in an interview by Craig Mullins, who was a phenomenal, phenomenal digital painter. And he would often paint himself into corners just so he could paint himself out. And I think that that is an important place to be in drawing and in painting. And oftentimes when you're feeling that frustration, that anger, that fight start to become generated, within you, it's a good sign that you're about to enter this state. You know, you, you have these evolutionary biology, you, or you have, rather, you have this evolutionary biology for a reason. And it's fight or flight responses, and it's different sensations that kind of demarcate those states for you. And once you're in those states, you can feel that, well, there's a use for this. Maybe I don't know what it is yet, but this frustration, this anger, it can have a use. Sometimes you do need to cool off because it's not time to fight with the drawing. But other times, you better put on the gloves because you're going in. The drawing is going to attack you, but it attacks you emotionally. It attacks you in the sense of, oh no, I'm starting to associate this with my self-worth again. I'm starting to associate this with my overall well-being in existence. My fridge might be full, my bank account might be doing just fine, but something about this feeling lets me know that things are not okay right now, and I've got to dig in and be ready for the brawl. So what do you do when it's time to fight, and you're feeling these sensations and you're getting heated? For me, I try to keep as much of a level head as possible, even though my body wants to go into a combative state. So I'm drawing and I'm getting rid of stuff that I don't like. I'm keeping the stuff that gives me the proper sensations, but that feeling of fight is still there. And it's time to really utilize it. So how do you harness that energy? For me, I use it to get rid of things that I don't like, to cut away, you know? You envision yourself as a warrior in a grassy field, a grassy clearing, and there are several enemies in front of you. All you have is a sword, and they have their own weaponry. You're going to use that hot energy, that angry, combative energy to cut things away. And for me... That takes the form of the lasso tool or the eraser. I am mercilessly letting go of parts that are not working, parts that don't give me a positive feeling. And I'm also using that energy to drive forward in a very gestural, loose way. It's really hard to be very articulate in your movements in this state. You are definitely a little berserk. And maybe it's better that you weren't, especially if you're inking or especially if you're doing cleaner work, but in the sketch phase, it can be useful. I wasn't ready to give in. I wasn't beaten. I had more energy in me. In fact, I had ample energy. The problem was then to control it. So what that looks like 
is dicing away all those parts that I'm not feeling and resetting with different drawing angles, trying to get those legs to come out properly in the perspective that I have aligned for myself. What I eventually came to realize was that I was trying to draw anatomy beneath clothing and my brain would not perfectly visualize the pelvis, its angles, and the weight that it was bearing in contradistinction to the legs and how they were connected to the ground plane whilst being able to also see the skirt above all of that. You see, the skirt is doing its job. It's hiding the anatomy. We all can't walk around naked, but you'll notice that even though I censored a great deal of the drawing for that Celia piece, I didn't include any clothing except for like a glove, you know, and that's just out of its rote. I do that just automatically because it helps me demarcate where the wrist ends and the hand begins. However, I was drawing a fully clothed figure in a position that I am uncomfortable with. I didn't even have a pose in mind, and I was also drawing her very large too, very big on the picture plane, as though I had the confidence, as though I had done this type of drawing before, even though I really haven't done it a whole bunch. So it's like playing a scale you're uncomfortable with, or cooking a meal in a style of cuisine you haven't really touched. You can't expect yourself to have the proficiency that you have in other areas. Only a percentage of those proficiencies will in fact carry over into your new endeavor. And so you're going to feel that fight that I mentioned earlier, which means you're going to have to place that energy in the proper parcels so that you can proceed. And then the learning occurs. You're working on the edge of your ability. You're spiced up, ready for combat, ready for action. And Still, you're clearing your mind to the degree where you will permit yourself to make good decisions, which give you more of what you want. So that's what I ended up doing. Uh, I got rid of the skirt. I was trying to draw a bunch of different leg positions, trying to get some personality across, trying to kind of tweak her angle, doing whatever I could to solve these drawing problems. But nothing was fully coming to fruition to my satisfaction. I'm getting more of what I want, but I'm not yet getting what I actually want. You see, it is binary, but at the same time, it is also a matter of degree. It is and it isn't binary. So what I mean by that is the binary is it's either zero or one, right? It's either yes, you're getting what you want or no, you are not getting what you want. But we have to think of it in terms of degrees. And so insofar as you're able to conceptualize it. Because let's say you are getting a fraction of what you want. You're getting maybe 50% of what you want. So what do you do? You make decisions on the picture plane that are giving you more of what you want. You're getting closer in degree. So you cut a big part away and maybe you, you were at 30% of what you wanted, but you cut something away. And conversely, you're now at 40% of what you wanted. You make a couple more marks and it falls down to 35. So you know that you're going in the wrong direction because you ideally want 100%. Now, are you going to get 100% of what you want? That's a question for another video. So you might want to like and subscribe so that we can talk about that later in one of our sketching sessions together. But I digress. We want to get closer in degree to what we're looking for. So that means that we need to cut away and add and kind of maneuver back and forth and parse our feelings and do whatever it takes to get there so that we can have that aha, so that we can be it. Okay, well, maybe I got 80% of what I wanted and that's fine for this drawing. I'm not going to finish it up in a crazy sort of highly rendered, highly polished way where every single mark I am completely and utterly satiated in every conceivable capacity. There's a time for that. But when we're learning, when we're exploring, when we're guessing, checking, testing, experimenting, 
that is not the time to be super precious. That is the time to learn. That is the time to do what this channel is all about and let go of preconceived, you know, perfectionism and instead delve deeper into the student's modality, the eternal student. And that eternal student mindset is about understanding what is working, what is not working, what do you want more of, and how do you get it? How can you take these techniques that feel good and advance them? You know, how can you work on the edge of your abilities so that you are challenged to that perfect point of progress? And a lot of my beginner drawing course is focused on that. A lot of my simple anatomy course is focused on that. You can find all these things in the description box below. They are very helpful, very good things that I have designed specifically with assignments to help you advance your artistic integrity and creative expression. And that's what I'm doing on this picture plane. I am focusing on what I want and I am reserving as much judgment as I can, especially of my own character. I'm not trying to assail myself with all of my failures and all of my woes and every bit of baggage I can possibly bring to this process. I'm just trying to free myself up and learn. And that's what I want for you. That's why we have these sketching sessions together to help you navigate that stuff. And just to be fair, I want to emphasize that navigating that stuff does take practice. I myself have been drawing sincerely for about 10 years now, you know, practicing drawing, not just using it as a means to try and express myself, but actually going in on technique and learning and trying to find ways to, you know, just improve. But the whole mental emotional component was something that eluded me and made my journey very difficult. I would probably say that a great deal of all of my mental health struggles and all of my issues kind of stemmed from that poor mental attitude and the lack of a toolkit when it came to sussing out problems in drawing and not assigning them to myself. It's not easy. It's not easy to learn to improve your abilities or to stay consistent or to endow yourself with the consciousness that will allow you to step back and observe and not judge. All of these things take practice and repetition and a good deal of openness. But if you're drawn to this creative act, or any creative act for that matter, then you're probably reasonably open to new experiences, new ideas, new philosophies, and new ways of improving. One of the things that I do to improve this drawing is actually to copy it several times over because it's one of the most wonderful things you can do digitally and suss out all the different areas that I was struggling with and try variations of them. Because if I'm sticking in one point, I want to know what other paths there are to solve the problem. Maybe you can't walk through the wall, but you can go around it or you can find a door somewhere. There are many ways to tackle the things that come up, so long as you let yourself be open to those ways. So, one thing I do want to talk about in this session, as we sketch together, is taking breaks. You don't want to break yourself in the process. And if you're getting obsessive, if you're feeling that manic feeling, you know, where you're gripping your pen too tight, you're working a little too quickly, you're in that combative state just a little too long, that wears on you. It wears on your ability to create uh, at a level that is healthy. You might make some good work, you know, but if you work yourself into a fugue state and you need to reach that fugue state in order to create good work, then one could definitely make the argument that you're paving the way for burnout. You have to find a way to be calm, to be relaxed, to be at one with your process. And yes, these emotions will come up and you will have different energetic states that you'll embody throughout the process based on your emotions. 
And yes, based on your different sort of ideas that you're working with, you know, you might be working on something that doesn't thrill you. And then you have to try to find something about it that's fascinating. And oftentimes that will carry you through. So I was working on this drawing and I found that I really wanted to find a way to make this feel better, to give me more of what I wanted. So I'm drawing through the skirt. I'm changing the position of the feet. I am finding those different ley lines and imagining the diagonals that allow me to connect her figure up more properly. But even though I had done a second drawing to try and find a better format for the techniques I'm trying out for this angle for this position and pose, I knew that I needed a third one to continue my learning. So I just, again, cut away the bottom half of the figure. I realized that more balance can be ascertained if I just rotate her, you know, about 12 degrees counterclockwise and we start to make progress. I chewed on the problem long enough. I worked through that feeling of combative sort of anger and frustration, but you can see how much I fought with this drawing. The, the quality of the lines show it. You can't hide these things. And that's why I want you to enter states of calm. It's fine when you're learning and fine when you're demonstrating. There's a place for these types of uh, emotions and a place for these types of working in terms of the modality but when you're trying to go for certain more pleasing results you don't want to have that energy come across in really sketchy kind of broken up ways but you can see I'm making those diagonals happen again because I knew that they resolved some of my issues with the perspective and the alignment in the seated drawing so why don't we try them in this standing one? And I found that, okay, well, the third drawing definitely feels the best. I'm also drawing the full body. I'm not trying to hide it through the skirt so that my brain can actually conceive of what's going on with the lower half of the figure. I'm flipping quite a lot because I want my eyes to remain fresh. And I'm seeing if I can make her more balanced even more anatomically correct. I'm just pushing the edges of my abilities. And even though it's super sketchy, the feeling is finally there. I am finally more satisfied with the way that the drawing is appearing, but I'm still not afraid to cut away parts that just aren't aligning in ways that I feel that they could. And I'm also experimenting a little bit with just pushing the personality just a little bit I really wanted to get that gesture to showcase what she's thinking, what she's feeling, how she operates and sees the world on a day-to-day -day basis. And as a bonus, when you're able to access these deeper states of feeling and understanding and experience, you can transpose them into your characters. You can use these things to better understand what it is your characters need to communicate and convey through their gesture, through their pose, through their face, through their hands. And that way you'll be able to add even more of that believability that you're looking for. So it wasn't until I got to the third drawing that I finally felt that I had gotten closer to what I wanted. More personality, a better pose, a more interesting angle than your average front standing angle and it just took some patience it took the reserving of judgment and it took the third version you know and that's a drawing i can clean up now that's a drawing i feel good about i feel like it's resoundingly solid enough for me to go in with a more appropriate brush and finesse the lines because then i'll focus on a different feeling because I wanted a certain degree of personality and solidity, and it's there for me to now draw out. Am I moving closer in degree to it, or am I messing it up? That's something that I'll have to ask once I switch over into that phase, which is not in this video. I may return to this you know, canvas later and develop these ideas further, but all of these are just ideas at this point. They are 
visually articulated ideas that I'm moving through and I'm paying attention to myself, my state in the midst of these ideas, this is what this time is for. There is a lot going on, but you're so immersed in the process that you are at one with it at times, and other times you're evaluating it, sometimes you're evaluating your own feelings, and shifting between these different uh, states of consciousness, these different modes of focus, will greatly enhance your artistic experience. You know, like I said, for the longest time, for several years, when I was doing client work, and, you know, sometimes I was very underpaid, but I had to take the job because I needed to eat, or sometimes I would just focus on all of these negative aspects, like how I would much rather be drawing for myself, how I'm tired of this project dragging on, how I'm sick of this round of revisions. And when my focus was placed on any of those elements, my drawing process was basically almost decimated, almost completely destroyed. So much of the joy left the process for me that it took me years to get it back. It's really something that I found was making me bitter, not just on the picture plane, but off of it. I was constantly displeased with the work because you're not going to do great work or good work in those states. You're going to use those feelings to harm your own character, your own self-worth, your own artistic way, just not even just your artistic well-being, but your being on multiple levels. So you have to do your best to root out that degree of toxicity because it seeps into absolutely everything. And yes, I was still professional. I was still getting commissions. Uh, sometimes they did pay very well. Sometimes they were paying less. That's just the freelance game. And it was a journey that I wasn't able to grow a great deal on. I wasn't doing any personal work. I was making videos for the channel and I was doing client work. So art became very impersonal to me. It became just work. There was barely any art in it. Yes, on, on paper, I was definitely creating drawings and paintings and finishing them up for clients, but I look back at that work now and it's so stiff, so uninspired, and so pained because I was in pain during that process. Uh, the same alarm bells would go off as I get today, but I would use that to mean, oh, something's wrong with me. Why do I hate this so much? Why can't I have fun anymore? Why do I still work for clients? You know, asking all the wrong questions based on a feeling. This is what is called emotional reasoning. And I've worked with my therapist and I've read a couple different uh, psychotherapy books on cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, CBT, and emotional reasoning comes up all the time. It's taking those feelings and using them to create thought forms and ascribing different meanings to those feelings with the thought forms. And those meanings are often self-destructive or... You know, they facilitate depression or anxiety or um, they destroy self-worth. And I think that it's a huge trap for artists. We think it's all just about making the art, but this is an all-encompassing game. It is simultaneously very freeing, but also incredibly challenging and can be very damaging in so many regards if you don't come at it with the most optimized insight possible and i i've been very very fortunate i've been incredibly blessed i've had some very hard years in this game but i have used them to galvanize my being and to learn the lessons and i'm now 30 years old i've been freelancing since i was 23 and it took me on such a journey that I had never thought was going to be so difficult, but I've come out the other end of it now. And hindsight is twenty twenty. you know? I found the right mixture of inspiring videos. I got lucky and got a mentorship that I've been doing for going on three months now. And I just kept working. 
even when it was hard. I don't really recommend this, but I don't know a way around it. I, I don't know if you can truly appreciate having the perspective of joy and well-being and artistic um, ambrosia until you have accidentally or coincidentally or just by proxy mired yourself in the opposite you know the other aspect of the pole and that is the pole of polarity i think that the best thing to do is to remain as neutral as possible to pull back all of the judgment all of the fear to pull back the self your idea of who you are what it means to be an artist all of it just free yourself because once you unshackle from the pains and the problems and you start to look at these things in a whole new light you'll find that the prism through which you were shining that light before may have just been the wrong prism you know there are many more geometric solids that you can cast that beam of consciousness that light through that will offer you much greater more beautiful kaleidoscopic visions of what it means to be able to sit down and to move your hand and to create things as a result what it means to practice techniques and to return to them and to augment your abilities with them what it means to go through a more hellish phase and to come out the other side scathed but breathing and renew yourself in ways that heretofore you just didn't know existed i had no idea that i could find the joy again i had no idea that making bad drawings didn't mean I was somehow a failure as an artist on some level or by proxy a failure as a person because I had dedicated so much of my life to art. And people have told me, you know, it's amazing that you pursued your passion. It's amazing that you kept going, that you have not given up. You know, so many people take a day job and their dreams kind of fall to the wayside. And that's the only thing that kept me going was that I knew I could never do that. There were times where I did take a day job, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it in any capacity. It just, for me, I couldn't wrap my, I couldn't wrap myself in enough blankets to make it okay, you know? I, I couldn't ever find a way to detach from art. It's so big of a part of me now that I've had to find a way to make this work. Even though... I avoided a lot of other pitfalls in life, like, you know, excessive drug use or um, other methods of coping that people use when they're deeply unfulfilled and deeply pained and they don't know how to detach from pain and, and view pain. Um, I think that that was a huge factor in getting to this point where I'm able to um, fortunately make a living doing it and also to really love that process. I still take commissions, even though I make, uh, you know, enough money to live from my course sales at this point. I still, it's it's not a ton of money. I promise you. I like I'm I'm not living high on the horse or whatever. I am still very much in student debt. Uh, it's it's not like I have this perfect, beautiful, um, gorgeously invested portfolio or anything. I, I'm still very much making it, only in the sense that I can save a a little bit every month. But I found that I have gotten to this place only as a result of being willing to go through all of the, the pains and the fears and the, the lows. But I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have videos that I could find that would give me the proper mindset, a mindset very specific to that of somebody who creates for a living, somebody whose skill is hard to quantify. You know, plumbers make a certain amount. People of other trades make a certain amount. Artists have a, it a lot more open-ended. The, the problem with this journey is that it is immensely vague, just like the feelings that we're talking about. 
They're hard to articulate. We don't have a lot of good language built around being able to codify these things because they elude linguistic barriers in many ways. And I'm not going to say I pride myself on my ability to articulate, although at one point I did. Um, but I, I feel that I have a reasonable grasp on my native tongue, yet it is still very, very challenging to put these things into words. But it's the best that I can do, and I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it so that whether you want this as a hobby, as a profession, or you've just stumbled into this video for the very first time, and you've for some reason listened this long at past the hour mark. I hope, I God, I hope you've taken a break. Um, I, I just want to share these things because I feel deeply obliged. I feel deeply indebted, and I can never fully ever repay that debt. The fact that people have cared enough to support me, send me good comments, that people have given me commissions, that people uh, purchase the courses. All of these things, I'm never going to say I feel like I deserve any of it. I just want to really state that gratitude is just as much of a powerful tool as anything I've told you up until this point. Being grateful that you have articulate hands, or even hands that you don't feel are articulate, as long as they can hold the tool and make marks, then you're in a good spot. You're in a place where you can learn and grow and change and get more of what you want out of this, you know? As long as you're being articulate with that, you're finding, okay, well, maybe you just want to draw sexy characters, and that's cool. You know, you love anatomy. You love um, stoking people's libido with your work, you know? It's okay to be a little bit... Um, a little bit excited on on your main account if that's if that's your thing like absolutely bless it if you're not hurting nobody then you're just doing your thing and that's what you want i don't think you should be ashamed i think that whatever you want to draw whatever you want to make whatever you want to share again so long as it's not doing any harm then you're in a good spot and i think you should let yourself have it you should let yourself explore for me, I love figures. Um, I, I think sometimes I'll make it a little sexy. Uh, I love different body types. I'm fascinated by the way that people's bone structure differs and the way that fat sits in different ways or muscle sits in different ways, the differences between men and women, um, the different ways that things transform in perspective. Uh, I just find all of it immensely fascinating. And this is going to be the final drawing you're seeing me start now. And I did a slightly um, angled view of the girl in red with the skirt where we're slightly looking down. You know, you can see and tell that by the top plane of her bust and the angles that I've drawn with my various ellipses throughout her um, figure there. This one we're looking up because I want her to appear powerful. It's not the same character, it's a different character. This is Pren, again from Gildian. Um, I just return to these characters time and time again because they have a myriad of different body types and different skills. They have different personalities, and I use that to practice. Um, yes, the project is very long-term and is rigorously unstructured at this point, but I know what I want from it, and I know that it carries me forward artistically, and that's enough for now. Um, perhaps if there were ever enough interest and intrigue, or when I find ways of presenting it that light people up inside and give them the feelings I have about this world, then I'll find ways to take it to the next level. But patience is a virtue too. You can see that my line work has slowed down again. My hand is moving slowly. I'm very conscious of the movement. It's nowhere near as sketchy and frustrated as the last drawing, but just you wait because we devolve into that state again. And the reason is because I feel the alarm bells. I see what I want to change. And I know that 
I need to not be precious about the drawing in order to change those things. Um, but I also know that I'm not completely going to stop. I have to keep drawing and have to keep learning and creating, even in that you know short sort of uh, vehement state. I'm never going to keep drawing if I hit a certain point where I feel like I'm just too frustrated. My hand isn't moving properly anymore. I'm too heated. I need to go do a couple reps, push-ups, pull-ups, whatever. Um, go for a walk, listen to some, you know, kind of angry music to give me an outlet for it. But navigating these feelings while you're drawing is as important as learning the techniques. So what I wanted from this drawing was sort of a dynamic kind of series of spells. It's also going to be angled in a way that I find interesting. I'm still trying to run these diagonals and visualize the cascade of shapes and that I'm using to represent the anatomy through these varying angles. And I'm doing this all from imagination because I'm really trying to force my brain to turn everything I know in different angles and directions and manifest that in a way that others can see, in a way that I'm satisfied with because that's just the type of practice I felt like doing today. There are so many different types of practices and ideas and ways of visualizing and ways of approaching a drawing or a sketch or um, you know, an exercise. And I, I detail quite a few of them in the beginner drawing course or some of the other courses that are on beginnerdrawingcourse.com. Um, if you ever need more structure, if you ever feel a little lost and don't know which way to work, um, I just offer some basics, some foundations, but technique will only get you so far, uh, especially once you lose interest in a drawing. I found that so many of my works, I would feel very, very frisky and spicy in the beginning, like so excited to start. And then as the drawing dragged on and the problems amassed and the areas that I had redrawn 12, 13, 14 times just would not for the life of me come together. And I got heated enough and defeated enough to quit, to leave the drawing alone. Uh, I just knew it was time to put it down and try again at a different juncture. It's really, really hard you know, it's like if you've ever skateboarded or tried doing a trick and you start to keep, you know, you keep failing at the trick over and over in rapid succession, you start to deplete your stamina, your focus, your, your sharpness begins to kind of dull and your frustration grows. It's like you have a certain meter and once that meter is full, uh, the frustration meter is very full and the stamina meter is way down you're not going to make anything good. You got to take a break. You got to recognize those feelings. You have to imagine those, those bars as if they were a user interface in a video game, because as far as we know what life is a game, nobody can prove absolutely with scientific and mathematical exaction that it isn't. So if that's the case, we can use games as simulations. We can acknowledge that there are, you know, health bars, they may not be as easy to quantify. You may not have a user interface floating around your vision all the time. And I think, to be honest, most of us would hide that interface because it gets annoying. We'd only check it when we need it to. But you can use that metaphor to figure out where you're at emotionally, mentally, in terms of stamina, etc., while you're working. So in this one, I, I was getting part of what I wanted. I liked the angle. I liked the strength of the pose, but it was very stiff. Everything is, as one of my mentors puts it, starfished. Now, starfished is where everything is splayed out. There is little to no overlap of any of the limbs from the torso, and it just looks stiff. It's very hard to do a starfish pose, quote unquote, without making it look really unnatural. So that's something I keep in mind as a dead end something that I hit or do by rote that I need to challenge. 
And I'm trying to break up some of that stiffness by adding flowing pieces of cloth, you know. But what you're going to see me doing for the rest of this video is just altering this pose, is not being precious about it. I wish I would have um, saved in the PSD uh, the different poses like I did with the previous drawing so that I could compare and contrast them. But a recording is good for the same reason, because we're going to be able to see that as you try different things, you can get better variations and you can really begin to push stuff. Now, oftentimes you have to push it until it breaks to know how far you can go. And that is sometimes a little scary. You don't want to see stuff break. If you've ever worked in a 3D program, when stuff breaks, when geometry collapses on you or inverts, it's real spooky. You know, it's a gross feeling. But you got to be able to get past some of those gross feelings, you know? Life isn't always full of pleasant sensations. And as far as human beings go, as these sensorial creatures that are able to detect and um, experience all these sensations and feelings, we have to be comfortable even with the uncomfortable ones. So here I am going in and eliminating different limbs in favor of redrawing them in more dynamic positions. So already that leg that came up a little bit feels more dynamic. She looks like she's popping back a little bit as she's casting the spell, you know. Um, she's more of a K shape rather than an X shape. You can think of things in terms of the alphabet too, because the alphabet is designed in a way that's very recognizable, and you can use it to drive compositions and poses. Uh, that's something very technical that I learned from Andrew Loomis that we'll get into more later uh, in more technically focused lessons. Uh, but for now, this is just a sketch with me session with a little bit of technique thrown in because I, I do love to talk about the technical stuff. I really do. It, it drove me for so long, um, even when I wasn't aware of how feeling affected the art or how feeling affected me in the process of making the art. Technique was all that I fell back on. And I think that it definitely improved certain aspects of the work, but sometimes you can't get a lot of feeling from technique. Something can be gorgeously executed and just fall flat in terms of the way it affects uh, somebody looking at it. Um, or maybe just artists will enjoy it for the sheer fact of how well it's done, but you won't be able to break outside that sphere and connect with the every person, you know, people who aren't into the making of such things or are only casually interested. If you want to be able to ignite those same feelings in other people, you have to understand that those feelings must be present in you in great volumes, at least not, um, or at least in small inklings. Otherwise, it's just not going to work out in that capacity. It's not going to be felt by those who are looking at it, even just to kind of beat a dead horse on that one, because I really want to hammer it home. Here's me redrawing the legs and poses yet again, not satisfied with how much I've pushed it. We're just going to keep pushing until we get something that feels like it's either too far or right on the money. I am going to get more of what I want out of this sketch, and that's how I feel about it. You can be stubborn. You can be selfish. This is your place to do that. This is your picture plane. This is your drawing. If you want dynamism, then by God, hunt it, find it, you know, make those angles, break out of all of those conventions that you thought you needed to adhere to, if it's going to give you the result you want. The rules, yeah, learn them and then find ways that they don't apply. It's really, really important because otherwise you'll be trapped. And there are so many traps on this journey. We've covered so many of them in our time together today. And I just want you to make sure you don't fall into too many of them because you only need to fall into them once or twice for it to become a habit or an accidental pattern. And what we want to do is interrupt and break the patterns that don't serve us. And we want to inculcate and re-optimize the ones that do. You know, the diagonal lines, I've been loving them. I've been loving the way they help me you know, parse out figures, but I got to know their limit. I got to know where they really work, where they really don't, and how to execute them properly. Because as a tool for drawing from your head, they're phenomenal. But 
sometimes they fall short and you got to test them out in many sketching sessions to know where they where they do and don't have their efficacy at any rate in this drawing i'm now really parsing a lot of the different um angles you know it not only is it a very challenging angle to draw but to try and throw different like perspectives of the limbs out you know does it how grounded should it feel is she in the air is she in the ground like i just wasn't able to find a pose that felt like it really fit you know this one feels a little more grounded like finally i'm finding the angle that i can shoot the leg out at with a more organic curve and she's on her toes it's almost a bit yogic i thought of like the warrior pose in yoga and studying different areas and different motions and techniques you can bring that stuff back you know sometimes it takes a lot of iteration and redrawing but you'll find areas you want to explore and to imbue so you have to come back and kind of ask yourself am i getting closer to what i want or am i getting further away from it in this case i was getting slightly closer but you can see how the drawing is getting hairier and ugly and more uncertain in terms of the line quality because it's only for me to read it visually it's not to be presentable and pretty and polished those are a different feeling you know those have a different feeling and there's a time for those and the time for those is after you figured out all the stuff you want to figure out so i'm not afraid to just mercilessly keep cutting stuff away until i rest from the void the result that i'm after and in this case I know I want more angles, more dynamism. I want it to feel grounded, but not too grounded. It's a very delicate balance. And yes, I've solved the starfishing issue, but now I'm coming up with these very strange poses. And when I say strange, I mean, they're just a little weird. You know, the feeling that I get in like my throat, I'm like, that's just weird. That's a little odd. It's not quite cringe, but it's a little, it's just a peculiar way to move. And... <laughs> It's, uh, I mean, people, comedians will use this to great effect because you almost want to laugh at it if you if somebody's really good at physical comedy. Um, it gives you these feelings of like, oh, I kind of want to laugh or I kind of want to like, like, kind of feel a little bit of a recourse or a little bit of disgust, a little bit of grossness, you know? And it's like, uh, I'm getting a grosser feeling from this one. It's a little bit derpy, a little just a little off, you know, it's not what I'm going for. Yes, it's a result, but my emotions are guiding me towards a different result. So I just trust that. I trust my intuition very deeply because it's carried me to the places I'm trying to get to. And the only way to, to cultivate that is to give your emotions that, that, that white card, that carte blanche, that ability to direct the process and steer the ship i mean sometimes your your logical brain is just there to figure out how to give the emotions what they want you know again it's okay to be selfish on the picture plane when you're doing your own work don't let any of that other stuff creep in don't let anybody's expectations creep in um i don't i wasn't thinking about what somebody's going to think of these drawings when i was making them you know i, I could care less what you actually think about the drawings um all i want was to explore and get closer to the things that I'm after. And I know that that process is enticing, to me at least. And the people who aren't here for it have already clicked away. It's perfectly fine, you know? I, a lot of people have trouble uploading their work or trouble with confidence, and I had a different problem. That's something that I, I have a harder time relating to because confident or not, I throw stuff out there. I'm. I'm very seasoned in putting my stuff in front of people. And that's something that I'll address in later videos if I can maybe help somebody work through it. Um, or for me, it's a musical thing. Like I don't put out a lot of my music because I, for one, it's underdeveloped. But I think that that's the excuse that everybody would use in their you know, creative pursuit. Like this just isn't developed enough for me to show. But it's not about perfection. It's about being in a in a like-minded community where other people are sharing things in various states too. And we can all appreciate the states of finish that everything is in, you know, Instagram is a fakey fake place. 
you're supposed to put on your best front. So these drawings aren't for Instagram. These drawings, you know, would barely fit on Twitter. Twitter's tons of sketchiness. You just got to find the place where things go, you know, and then you can release them. At least that's what, um, that's what I've been feeling lately. You can take all this with a grain of salt, you know. I want you to come to your own meanings and conclusions uh, just so long as they're serving you, just so long as they're serving the art, just so long as they're not taking you down paths that are wrought with pain and hardship for no good payoff, for no good reason. Most of the time, uh, the pain is just there to show you you're not on track. At any rate, I finally got as close as I feel I was going to get, or at least as much energy as I had in, in proportion to the, the closeness of what I wanted or the degree of what I wanted. So I decided that I'm just going to start throwing out uh, some different shapes of the spell that she's casting, uh, some sort of geomancy. I love earth-based spells. Just love them. I don't need a reason. They're just delicious. I've always thought they were super cool, and so that's what I'm doing. I just want to showcase how cool I think it is to float some rocks and shoot them at your enemies. I mean, it just gives me a really cool feeling. My chest opens up, I'm like, enemies are going to get pelted with rocks, and that's what's up. I don't need anything more than that. Um, but I want to amplify that feeling at any at any cost, you know. I'll keep breaking and reconfiguring the drawing until I feel like those the figure is serving that and the rocks are serving that, or at least until I've run out of energy and I can try it again. This was a really hard pose, and there are definitely perspective issues. Like, I would have to completely redraw her torso based on the ellipse at her hips, but I still knew that I could push things just a little bit further, even though I'd finished up all my practice time that I had allotted for Sunday. Sunday's a pretty chill day for me. Sometimes I only draw, like I said, 25 minutes, sometimes not at all. Um, sometimes 90 minutes of practice and study. So here's me just trying to alter the pose just enough from the, uh, the perspective of the hips. Here's me changing the angle yet again to a sharper angle, rotating, getting more of that dynamism in there. She's leaning into it. Her spine is not straight. Um, but I did not like the way that some of those rocks went with her, so I decided I'll have to go back and relasso those and try again. But you see, we're always moving in the direction of things we want. And even if I'm never going to finish this sketch, I know that the learning is going to stick with me. I know the doggedness and tenacity of being able to reconfigure a base sketch until it is ready to be taken to the next point, and I can move forward with confidence, is still going to be with me, even if these sketches never go beyond this point. Um, I also serve the purpose of being able to talk to you at length, to be able to share some of the wisdom that I've accrued over the past um, you know, eight years as a freelance illustrator and concept artist, as somebody who recently has, is in the, the tail end of their mentorship with artists who are more advanced than me, who I look up to, um, as someone who has put themselves in the position to teach people who might not have the resources otherwise. The drawing has served all of those purposes, so even if I never finish it, I think that it's done what it needs to do. Everything has, has come forward in a way that I am pleased with. So now I have this rad sketch, to me a rad sketch, of a geomancer spell with angles that I feel good about, um, with a really cool, dynamic feeling. It's still a little bit starfished, but it's closer to what I wanted. If you compare the first pose and how stiff that was, to this pose, we're leagues of dynamism forward, you know? Sometimes I'll even think about it in terms of a frame-by-frame -frame animation. If she starts off standing and stiff, but then transforms into this blast forward kind of uh, posture, you know, the spine coming forward and driving everything else with it, the limb being angled, the other limb being straight. We have straights, we have angles, and the flowing clothes would be the curves. And then you have this wonderful juxtaposition of all of these elements that play off one another. And if I squint, I can see the vibration of the motion, which is something I talk a lot about in my courses. Um, and I like it. You know, I dig it. 
it feels much better than the feeling I first got when I was working on this sketch. And I want to thank you for drawing with me today or just listening if you did that. I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to work on your abilities and to uh, show whatever support that you have for the channel, even if it's just watching the video. Much love. Please keep drawing. Please keep doing your thing. Uh, don't be afraid to watch this more than once to pick up on nuggets you may have missed. Uh, but until then, I'll say happy creating, happy drawing, and I'll see you next time. Take care.